Today I'm going to walk you through the responsive design template that I use as the foundation for most of my Power Apps. By the end of this video, you'll not only have your own version of the template, but you'll understand some of the key design decisions that make it flexible, clean, and easy to reuse. Let's dive in. Channel members have access to download the apps used in the videos, as well as the YAML code used in the components that I showcase. You can click the join button below the video if you're interested in supporting the channel. We'll start with a blank screen, and on top of that, I'll add a vertical container called Container Screen. I'll set the width and height to match the parent so that it fills the entire screen, and we'll give it a light gray background. We'll also be sure to set the X and Y values to zero, and we'll remove the drop shadow and set the border radius to zero. This outer container acts as the shell that all of our other containers will live inside. Next, I'll add a horizontal container inside our screen container, and we'll call this container header. I'll give it a fixed height of 48, and we'll set the items to align in the center. We'll also set the border radius to zero. Now below our header, we'll create another horizontal container, and we'll call this container parent main. This is where we can split our screen into our sidebar on the left-hand side and our main content on the right. For our parent main container, we'll set the minimum width to zero, and we'll set the minimum height to zero as well. We'll set the border radius to zero and the drop shadow to none. Next, in our parent main container, we'll insert a vertical container, and we'll call this container sidebar. We'll set the minimum height for this to zero, and we'll disable flexible width and set our width to 260. We'll set the border radius for this to zero, and we'll keep the drop shadow as light. Now we can insert a horizontal container into our parent main container, and this will take up the right portion of our parent container. We'll call this container main. Now this is a relatively new concept that I've started implementing with the addition of the new maximum height and width feature. The purpose of this horizontal container is purely to middle align our content when the screen is very large. So we'll middle justify the content of this container and we'll set the border radius to zero. This is also going to be the container that handles our scrolling on the screen, so we'll set the vertical overflow to scroll. Inside of our main container, we'll now insert a vertical container, and this vertical container is the one that will actually contain our content. We'll call this container sub main. We'll do a couple things for this container. We'll center align its contents. We'll set the gap to 16, and we'll set the padding on all sides to 16 as well. We'll come back to minimum height in a moment, but for the maximum width, we want to set this to the maximum allowed screen size that this container can flex up to. For this demonstration, I'll just use 1100. We'll also set the border radius to zero and the drop shadow to none. Because our main container has the vertical overflow set to scroll, we need to make sure that any content in our sub-main container auto-adjusts itself so that if it overflows past the sub-main container, the sub-main container responds accordingly and adjusts in size to show all of its contents. That way, if the sub-main container is larger than the main container, the scroll bar will appear on the main container. We put the scroll bar on the main container because the main container is the one that will actually touch the side of the screen. In the case of the scroll bar being on the sub-main container, on larger screens you would have a scroll bar that's much farther in the middle of the screen compared to on the edge of the screen. We can see this if I simply enable the vertical overflow and insert a control with a height that is much larger than the sub-main container. In this view, we can see the scroll bar is pretty well aligned to the right-hand side, but if I play the app, we can see that because the maximum width of this sub-main container is smaller than our screen size, 1100 in this case, the scroll bar is kind of hanging out in the middle of the screen. By keeping this container's vertical overflow as hide and letting the main container scroll vertically, we can have that scroll bar over on the right-hand side. To adjust the sub-main container's height automatically, we'll enter a vertical container, and we'll call this container sub-main auto height. We'll disable the flexible height option and set the height to one, and we'll also disable the drop shadow. Back on our sub-main container, we'll set the minimum height of this to the maximum value of either parent.height 
or our container submain auto height container dot y. If we do that same thing where we insert a text control and then change its size to something like 2000, we can see there's no scroll bar at this point, and we just need to make sure that in our template, we place all of our controls above that auto height container. As soon as we move the control above that container, you can see our scroll bar appears. And this scroll bar is actually on our main container. If we highlight our sub main container, you can see it's actually spilling over the canvas and that's causing our main container to have a scroll bar. Now when we play our app, that scroll bar is aligned to the right hand side. And again, that's because the scroll bar is on our main container. I'll give our sub main container a color just so you can see that a little bit easier. You can see the gray color is where the maximum width property is stopping our sub main container from expanding further. There's a couple final tweaks we can make just to clean things up a little bit. In our screen container, we can add a gap of two, and that way we can fully see the drop shadow that happens at the bottom of our header container and the top of our main container. When the gap is set to zero, we don't fully see the entire drop shadow as it kind of gets cut off. For the height of our header container, I chose 48 because this is the typical height of the headers that you see in Microsoft 365. We can right click the header of this Power App, and just by inspecting Element in our browser, we can see that the height is 48 pixels. Let's go ahead and rename our screen to Template. And then we'll duplicate our screen, and we'll try building something with it. For our header, we'll just insert a header control, and we'll enable the stretch option with a minimum height of zero. We'll go to our sidebar container, and we'll insert our Fluent 2 nav component. For this, we'll enable flexible height and we'll set the minimum height to zero. We'll also set the width to stretch with a minimum width of zero. I realized back at the beginning when we set the color of our screen container, the alpha value was set to zero. So once we set that to one, we get this nicer gray background. As far as where that background color choice comes from, if we go over to Power Apps, you can see it matches this same background color that you see in the Power Apps portal, as well as some other Office 365 apps. So now let's actually insert our content. In our sub main container, we'll go ahead and insert a new horizontal container. We'll call this Container Cards. We'll disable the flexible height option, we'll set the height to 350, and we'll set the background color to white. We'll also set the border radius to 12. So now we have this container that we can insert some Fluent2 cards into. So we'll just insert a couple of those from our component library. In our container, we'll also middle justify and vertically center those cards. We'll also add a gap to these, maybe something like 24. Inside of our sub main container, let's also just add some text. We'll say this is an example header for the screen. And we'll set this to stretch with a height of 40. We'll increase the font size pretty significantly to 20, and we'll set the weight to semi-bold. Whenever we're inserting controls into our sub-main container, we simply need to make sure that our auto height container is at the bottom of the container. And that way, if any of the contents spill over the container, it will automatically adjust and show the scroll bar for our main container. We'll move our header up to the top, and we're starting to have a pretty modern looking page. We'll insert another container into our sub main container, and we'll simply just use this as a little divider. We'll set the height as one and the color to this light gray color. We'll simply call this divider. Again, we'll move this above our auto height container, and then we can insert our next section of content. In our sub main container, we'll insert a vertical container, and for this, we'll disable the flexible height option and set the height to 400. We'll set the background color of this to white, and we'll also increase the border radius to 12. In this container, we'll insert a table control, and we'll just connect this to some sample data. We'll rename its parent container to container table, and then again, we'll move this above our auto height container. When we do that, we can see a scroll bar gets added and this allows us to scroll down to see the rest of our table. Maybe we have an area with two columns that we want to insert onto our screen. So we'll insert a horizontal container and we'll call this container two columns. 
You can see if we scroll down, we can't see this container. And that's because, again, our auto height container is above it. So we need to move that down below. And then we can see we're able to scroll down and see that container. For this container, we'll disable the flexible height option and we'll set the height to 250. We'll disable the drop shadow and then we'll set the gap to 24. In this container, we'll go ahead and insert two vertical containers. For both of these vertical containers, we'll set the color to white and we'll increase the border radius to 12. Now, again, you can see the drop shadow for these containers is kind of cut off. On the left and top sides, you can see there's not really much of a drop shadow. But on the right hand side, you can see between the containers, the drop shadow is shown. To fix this, we can simply go to our two columns container and add one pixel of padding on all sides. Now our drop shadow is visible again. For both of these containers, I'll just go ahead and insert some content, maybe a header control with some changes made to it, and then a simple gallery where we'll set the minimum height to zero. These look just a little bit squished, so we'll go ahead and increase the size of our two columns container to 300. Now with that done, let's talk about making some of this responsive. If we play our app, we can see our screen acts pretty much like a normal website. We can scroll down, we can see our information, and everything is a pretty smooth and seamless experience. If we switch to a mobile or a tablet view with a smaller screen, you can see that some things start to happen. Our cards start to get cut off, and potentially on a smaller screen size, these two column containers could start to get cut off as well. If I rotate this to a portrait view for a tablet, you can see that happening here. So how do we make those dynamic? There's a couple ways to go about doing this, but I usually recommend something very similar to what we're doing with the auto height container or the vertical height of our submain container. The easiest way to make this dynamic is simply by enabling the wrap property in the parent container, and then we'll change the height property to the maximum value of either 350 or the last card in our container, or in this case it would be the last control in our container dot y plus the last control in the container dot height. This looks normal in a desktop mode, but if we go ahead and play our app, you can see that in the portrait orientation, the container expanded appropriately, and we can scroll through the entire page. If we flip to landscape, things collapse back down because we have two cards in one row and then the single card at the bottom. Now there's not much padding at the top and bottom, so what we can do is we can go to our cards container and add 16 pixels of padding on all sides. In the height property, we'll also add self.padding bottom to both the Y and the height property of the last control in the container. Now when the container auto expands, you can see there's some extra padding around the edges. We can do a similar thing here where in our two columns container, we'll enable the wrap property. That changed the height of our two sub containers here. So we'll just set those to top align and we'll set the height back to 300. Now for the height of our two columns container, we'll set the height to the max of either 300 or the last control in our container, which in this case is container 14. We'll set it to the Y property plus the height property of this, as well as self dot padding bottom. In a desktop view, this looks normal. And if we play our app and go into a tablet view, we can see those now wrap to a new level. So each of those columns became its own individual row. If we flip over to landscape, now there's enough space for both of them to be on the same line, and we can see that they adjust accordingly. Now you might say this is a lot of work up front, and you would be right. The benefit to designing your apps like this is that it makes things so much easier to add elements to your screens later in development. If we think about our Power App as being more of a web page, we're really just adding parts to it using containers and components. Let's say we want more cards lower down in our container. We could simply insert those, drag them above our auto height container, and then also add a divider between them. Now our app auto adjusted its height, and we can see our new cards at the bottom of our screen. Even within our containers, we benefit from using responsive design, as if we add more cards to this, we can see our container automatically tries to adjust. 
in this case, we would just need to change the height property of our container to again reference the last control in our container. And very quickly, we went from just having three cards to six cards that dynamically adjust based on the screen size. Within our two column container, if we had another element to add to this, we could simply add that at the end and then change our height reference to the new container that's last in this container. For this new container, we could set the minimum width as something higher, like 800, and now we can see that it's too large to fit on the same line as the other two, and our container automatically wrapped and placed that on a new line. We can call this header 3. If we play our app again, we can see everything adjusted accordingly. In a mobile view, we would typically hide the sidebar, so we'll just hide that manually and play our app to look at it on a mobile view. And again, with everything we put into the design of this page, it easily adjusts to a mobile view. And that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this video looking at setting up your own template for responsive design. While there's some upfront initial work to get this working, the benefit here is that responsive design can help keep your app consistent across all of your devices, regardless of the screen size. I also find that it increases the speed of your development when making changes to an app that was built with responsive design upfront. As we saw, the elements on the screen automatically adjust. So in a way, you're allowing the design to be based off the user's device rather than trying to manually place elements on the screen. Let me know what you thought of this style of video and whether you think you'll use some of these techniques in your own apps. I hope you enjoyed and have a great day.